This season of Girl Talk is proudly sponsored by Highway Vision. With digital camera editing, small production and format transfers, let Highway Vision put you in the picture. I'm not a writer and uh, I'm an avid reader but never remember a book or a title much beyond after I've read it, I sort of read it for pure pleasure. Um, I sort of it's, have many stories to tell and uh, listening to Kath earlier reminded me of a time as a young lesbian feminist, as Crusader pointed out, like we all are it seems here today, I was on a collective called the uh, Anti-Anzac uh, Day Collective and it was a collective that was very uh, specific in its function. It was to uh, dismantle the war machine and that was pretty good. And uh, there was two lines of thought at the time. One was the, uh, the, the pacifist, non-confrontational approach, which was sort of about a lot of talking and about sort of uh, wearing black and mourning the dead. The other was hire the truck, hire the PA, get your megaphone and get out there. So after many meetings at the Kingston and the Young Women's Housing Collective and other sort of radical places of meeting back then in the early 80s. Uh, we end up on a truck, a whole bunch of young, old uh, and uh, different, differently abled and differently coloured uh, women. And we start going down St Kilda Road and the, the march is coming up St Kilda Road. We've already been warned off uh, the war memorial and they've already passed the uh, specific legislation that was specifically uh, passed to prevent women, uh, mourning women uh, that had lost, that had uh, died in war. So we're obviously in the, uh, not in the pacifist group because they were sort of uh, just ringing the memorial outside the no-go zone. <laughs> so we go up St Kilda Road in this stage, we end up riding to Burke Street because Burke Street hadn't, uh, Swanson Street hadn't been turned into a mall then. And we're, and I've forgotten most of the chants, but it was the old 2468 Dead Men Don't Rope. Um, the don't, don't be too polite, girls, don't be too polite. Uh, you know, we'll keep up, rah, rah, rah. Anyway, for anyone who knows, I think it was Belle Lane and my turn on the back of the truck, and we were fairly young and youthful at the time. And a guy gets up on the back of the truck, unbeknownst to us, and we're going, rah, rah, rah. I said, I've forgotten all the chants, but. Um, Within a couple of minutes, he's unscrewed his leg and he's thrown it at us. And so we're here with this leg and he's doing that, you're too ugly to get, he'd want to rape you anyway. And I'm standing there with this leg in um, Swanson Street and I just said, you haven't got a leg to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, and I said, my, it was really one of those things where, and it was, oh my God, and you know, they, uh, it made the age, the Tanberg, so, you know. As a young um, woman, you know, who was sort of exploring all things politically correct but all things real it was one of those things that it was a it was a very it's a story that stayed with me about what line you tread so and that in fact sometimes it's not about a line you tread but I suppose more about what you do. Being involved in Midsummer was the change from joining I suppose a coalition group from having previously being really active in a feminist lesbian and back then you even defined your socialist or radical nature so coming from a social lesbian feminist collective background to gay coalition politics and now 10 years later you know defining uh, inclusive language like transgender bisexual uh, and everything that is non-straight it's been an interesting journey and one that I haven't documented anywhere and uh, at times I think particularly with the work I've done not just with Midsummer and also but with all the groups we worked with we were in the Caviar Club raising money for good causes because, you know, all property was theft and, you know, we just thought we loved running dance parties and thought we needed to give the money away. Um, it's, it's been interesting to go from, as a young woman, organising dances where we had childcare 
and uh, you know paid our security fifteen dollars cash in hand to twelve years later not having childcare and now being able to pay security twelve dollars cash in hand. So it's <laughs> it's you know it's it's uh, it's an interesting um, environment to work in and to be active in, and I still feel really committed to a number of causes. But I suppose uh, you know I think with um, as you get older, you do tend to get more selfish and you just hope that those universities are doing something right and training the next breed of uh, radical dissidents. But I still think that with um, new age and people thinking that they can meditate and change the world from within, that there's a lot of, uh, there's very little group action these days. And I really hope that uh, some of the people here, uh, you know, and maybe some people that have come to the readings and actually uh, are consumers of Midsummer and consumers of gay and lesbian culture do remember that there's a difference between uh, reading, listening, and I suppose being a passive consumer to actually being an activist. I thought I might do a bit of a visioning exercise. And is six minutes like, like we're supposed to go off at six minutes? Is that now? <laughs> it's 2020. No, it's 2020. Australia is a great place in which to live. It was touch and go there for a while in the early part of the new millennium, but Australians came to realise their senses and banished John Howard to the opposition benches at the first national election in 2001. <laughs> Thankfully, the Conservatives haven't seen the inside of the Cabinet room ever since, and they aren't likely to. Australia is enjoying a never-before-seen degree of national prosperity. And we also, we're also regarded as the most socially progressive country in the world. Australians enjoy high living standards, quality living environments, as well as a protected environment and unrivalled opportunity. We've also taken our place internationally and have been instrumental in leading other countries down the track of creating communities that are inclusive, tolerant and fantastic places in which to live. This is due in part to the defection of a former leader of the Australian Democrats to Labor. Only this time, it was much more successful than her predecessor, Cheryl Curnow's earlier attempt. After only one year on the Labor front bench, Natasha Stott Despoja became Prime Minister. And she served in that role for 15 years. 15 years of unfettered social progress, economic growth, and environmental protection. Along with ushering in the Stott Despoja Prime Ministership in 2005, it was revealed in that year that Cheryl Curnow's earlier problems in coming to terms with life as a Labor MP were in fact due more to her increasingly ambiguous sexuality than the tribalism of the Labor Party. <laughs> Cheryl came out in 2005 during her term as a Federal Minister for Education. Her own experiences uh, led the Minister to develop a new educational initiative called Beyond 2005, which that very year helped high schools grapple with the issues faced by same-sex attracted young people. The initiative was happily adopted by state schools across the nation. Catholic and independent schools took the Minister to the High Court, but the entire court ruled in favour of the government, and the Catholic Church handed all of its schools back over to the states as a result. The program is highly successful, due in part to the fact that the teaching profession is staffed by large numbers of gaby boomers, a term used to describe individuals born to gays and lesbians in the 1990s. <laughs> Prime Minister Stott Despoja has since built on Kurnow's work as Minister for Education with a pledge in her 2015 State of the Nation address that no Australian child will live in fear of coming out. Natasha was equally committed to overcoming poverty among young and old Australians alike and recognised that education was the key to national and personal po prosperity. She subsequently made education at all levels, including tertiary education, free. Completely abandoning the higher education contribution scheme, Natasha's government reimbursed people who attended university in the 80s and 90s, paying them their hex fees with interest. I donated half of my proceeds to my former school who have built their new state-of-the-art creative arts building called the O'Reilly Centre. 
The other half I donated to Burkina Faso, where it helped retire a third of that nation's debt. And you're here for this book launch. Yep. How did you come to that? Well, it was very generous of Erin Shale, the editor of the book, to ask me to launch it. Uh, she asked me to write a little paragraph for the, uh, for the cover and uh, then asked me to come and launch it. And I thought it was going to be this, you know, little sort of book launch, because I've done a few book launches in my time, but I've never seen an audience <laughs> this big. Um, all this noisy, it's wonderful. <laughs> but um, I just support the work that she's doing and I think that you've got to have politicians and decision makers uh, declaring where they stand on these issues and unfortunately not a lot of politicians are prepared to do that. Yeah. Can you tell me some of the, the stories in the book that have moved you in particular? You mentioned some of them during the speech. I think most of them are moving either in an inspirational way or because of their courage, mm -hmm. even their sadness. I think the most moving, as in you will re be reduced to tears, no question, is Joy Anderson's chapter. It's the final chapter of the book and it's about her son James and uh, the fact that he killed himself and from a mother. I mean, it's so, it, it's very moving and it's insightful too. Um, but all of them are just quite extraordinary, whether it's high profile people like Bob Brown or mm -hmm. the rugby player Ian Roberts uh, or Sue Ann Post who described discrimination, difficulties in coming out and then sort of their happiness and enlightenment. But there are other people who talk about suicide and their attempted suicide, whether it's Paul Martin or, in fact, men and women in the book uh, talk about suicide attempts and that's very challenging because I was going through and I thought, okay, I'm up to about a third of the book and a third of the people in it have had, you know, described attempted suicide mm -hmm. or contemplating suicide mm -hmm. and that's just incredibly disturbing. But, you know, the figures tell us that's the case, 30% or so of youth suicides are related to sexuality. This season of Girl Talk is proudly sponsored by Highway Vision. With digital camera editing, small production and format transfers, let Highway Vision put you in the picture.